Hello, March is the month in which the Oscars are presented, so it's with a nod to Hollywood and the impact of cinema on our culture that my guest for this deep dive conversation is Dr. Paul Dark. Dr. Dark's decade-long passion for the movies led him to write a doctoral thesis entitled The Cinematic Construction of Physical Disability as Identified Through the Application of the Social Model of Disability to Six Indicative Films Made Since 1970. This excellent study sets out clearly Dr. Dark's view that popular culture plays a significant role in the process of demeaning disabled people. Dr. Dark is making good on his belief that popular culture is in need of change through organising disability arts events and commissions in Shrewsbury in the United Kingdom, as well as running his own disability arts organisation called Outside Centre. Dr. Dark is also involved in an annual disability film festival, and I'm delighted that he's my guest for this conversation. Dr. Paul Dark, welcome. It's nice to be here. Excellent. So let's go straight to it then. Why and how did you get interested in the cinema? Uh, well, uh, well, obviously I'm old enough uh, to be that it was before social media and the internet and all that kind of stuff. So uh, in my youth, uh, I, I used to go to the cinema all the time, three, four, five times a week. My father was a cinema projectionist uh, between the wars and the First World War and the Second World War. It shows you how old I am. It shows you how old my father was. And so I grew up with a love of black and white cinema, classic Hollywood narrated cinema, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Humphrey Bogart. And of course, uh, when I was younger, they were on the television all the time as well. And you had to watch a lot of old stuff. There wasn't much new stuff. And so uh, that's what I that's what I grew up loving. And I I love the escape of being in a cinema. And I, I used to especially love going when there was no one there. So afternoons in an empty cinema on your own with a massive screen to escape uh, reality was just fantastic. And when did you make this connection that cinema was doing a poor job when it comes to the portrayal of disabled people? I suppose not really till much, much later, because I one of the things I like about cinema is, is that you you don't think about it critically while you're sitting there in the dark cinema. You just absolutely engage with it. And even if it's depicting oneself in a fairly negative way, uh, you don't really notice it. It kind of bypasses until you start thinking about it. And so it wasn't really till after I did my first degree and I did a dissertation on disability in American literature for my BA. And then uh, as I moved on, I did an MA in American Lit and I did a dissertation on that for my MA as well. And so then it was kind of like, I don't enough of reading, basically. So, and I wanted to go back to my true love and I just thought, what oh, disability in it. So it wasn't really till you know, 20 years ago that I really engaged in it. And I, I sort of explored the social model on my first degree, second degree, and then it sort of all brought it together. We're going to drill down into exactly what you mean or exactly what's meant by this idea that uh, cinema is doing a poor job when it comes to the representation of disabled people. But let me just put to you one or two ideas. A disabled actor features in the hit TV series Breaking Bad, Peter mm -hmm. Dinklage is surely the star of Game of Thrones. One of France's most popular films in recent years, The Untouchable, focused on the relationship between a quadriplegic and his carer. That film cost nine million to make and took close to 300 million at the box office. Clearly, Hollywood is interested, or cinema in general, is interested in featuring disabled actors or people with disabilities. So what, what exactly is the problem with cinema when it comes to disability rights, Dr. Dark? I think the core problem is, is uh, well, I, Hollywood is always going to be interesting because it makes money because non-disabled people are fascinated by difference because all of our identities are incredibly fragile. And so we love things that reinforce our sense of ourselves and that's the core problem with Hollywood cinema or mainstream cinema is that what it reinforces for a mainstream audience is the notion of normality, not the value of difference within itself. And that's why they're very successful as well. So what mainstream cinema does is, is tell normal people it is terrible to be disabled. It is wonderful to be normal and you are wonderful because look at these people, you're not like them. And that's why it's a success and it works. 
and that it is highly damaging to disabled people. Films have, by definition, a responsibility to focus on the issue of human drama rather than the disability or the social context. And that if we, if we go the other way, then we get into this business of social engineering and politics, which isn't really the point of cinema. Uh, I would argue it, it may not necessarily the point. The point of the, the point of cinema is business, is money, it's making a product that people sell and buy, uh, and you make a profit on it. That, that's that's the art of cinema in the mainstream. But I think there is an there's another cinema that's state funded, both by the EU plays a role in that, uh, and national governments. The French government funds cinema massively, as do the German government, as do our government through either direct funding or indirect funding through lotteries that it sets up. For example, in England, it's mainly funded by the lottery, which is state controlled. And so the state has a key role uh, in setting the agenda for what what that cinema does. And that's why I think this is a very important issue that we need to ensure that state and and those media producers that do have a social responsibility, so for example, the BBC and Channel 4 in the UK, Arte in Europe, those kind of broadcasters and state broadcasters that do very clearly have an agenda about social engineering and cultural engineering and pushing forward a certain kind of civilised moral agenda, that actually the disability isn't left out of that, as it so often is. And actually, they resort to the same dubious, negative, undermining kind of representations, ideologies, cultural representations of of particularly disabled people that are both irresponsible and damaging to disabled people themselves, and I would argue to society at large. So from that then, Dr. Dark, what, if I understand correctly, you want um, state-funded cinema to include disability themes to dispense with this medical model of of uh, disability what else should they do well i suppose there's a couple of things there i don't want them to dispense with anything what i want them to do is be uh varied and inclusive of a wide range of people and and kind of representations i don't mind the most awful representation of disability because everybody else is represented awfully in certain things, you know, the heroes are this or that, you know, and that comes down to race, sexuality, gender. The problem with disability is you get almost none of the, the good stuff, the stuff that is insightful, intelligent, made by disabled people themselves is very, very limited. And it's that kind of pluralism that I want. So I've never been one to say that, stop that, do this. A lot of disabled people do do that, and that's a mistake, because you shouldn't stop anybody making anything oh, within reason. But it's more about giving us the opportunity to, to, to add to that range of cultural interpretations of our lives. And so and that, that counterbalances and counteracts a whole range of negative stuff with what some of us will see positive because equally what i see as positive other disabled people will see as negative and what they see as negative i might see as positive or vice versa so i, I don't want to it's more about that what we have with disability is is we have a very narrow field and what i want to do is broaden it and so it's more inclusive more rooted with the kind of the multi varied voices of people within society that's all i want and that's what the state state cinema should do the irony is often because mainstream cinema is is often so dull and repetitive and boring that actually they're actually better at including a wider variety of disabled people in their cinema than actually the state funded cinema that should do that. So for example, Hollywood has done some really great films about disability. Not just they're about making money, nothing so I think Mel Brooks Young Frankenstein is a masterpiece about disability. It's purely about disability and difference and the notion of what's normal and what's abnormal. And it's an absolute masterpiece. Nothing to do with the state, nothing to do with, you know, state funded cinema whatsoever. But Hollywood actually, because it is a purely creative driven basis, often comes up with truly fantastic stuff. I think some some bits of uh, 
other thing like the sessions with Helen Hunt about a quadriplegic and, and having a sex surrogate and being able to build their confidence and relationship. There was problems with that film, but pure Hollywood, not not state funded. So actually, and it's the state. And when I say the state, I mean that in the broadest possible terms, because I don't want the state to step in and go, you should do this. But actually, if those kind of organisations, the BBC, RT, were more culturally representative, they would be delivering a broader cultural range of imagery. Isn't it dangerous, however, to be putting your all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, when it comes to uh, encouraging state-funded cinema to to have uh, greater plurality? Because the, just the money isn't there. Oh no, 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 that's true. The money is there. The money is there, and and I think that that's one of the problems. This, the 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 French state, particularly, uh, I think the German state, uh, the Danish state, Scandinavian states, the British state, they put tens, if not hundreds, of millions of pounds into culture every year so the money's there it's it, what what's lacking is the will and the desire to be culturally inclusive wouldn't it be wouldn't it be useful to show dot to dot that the these kinds of plural a, a, a plural understanding of what cinema can be when it comes to dis, disability rights and disabled people could also be commercially lucrative uh, absolutely absolutely because i i think I'm a great believer, make it and people will come. They may not come initially and they may need to get kind of trained into kind of being imaginative in how they think about themselves. But there will be resistance because, you know, this sounds awful, but normal people are trapped in the idea that they're normal, even though normality doesn't exist. But actually, people are open, they are honest, and they are decent. But and often, a lot of this doesn't need to make money either. For example, Arte makes lots of films that are just going to end up on, 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 on kind of European uh, television. Uh, same with the BBC, it produces films that are, they're, they're never going to make money. The lotteries in England make loads of films that are never about making money. They are about pushing a social agenda. And it's just about making sure that we're part of that. You're probably aware of this new film. I think it's called Boston. It, it's a, a film that's about the aftermath of the terror attack on the Boston Marathon. Mm-hmm. And an actor, Jake Gyllenhaal, has been cast in the, in the lead role. What do you make of the view that casting an able-bodied actor to play a character with disabilities is similar to asking a white actor to black up for a role? I think it's a very difficult one because, again, cinema is a business, so you, you, you need a name at the, at the top of the screen to, to bring in an audience, and, and there aren't that many disabled people who can do that. I think what, what it comes down to is actually got much more of, of a kind of superstructure and base of the kind of the creation of, of, of narratives in that, for example, often you cannot have a disabled person because the narrative will often require flashbacks, to a notion of normality. So most cinema is, uh, the dominant representation is acquired impairments, for example, the Boston one being a good example. And when you, when that's your primary focus, because you, you're, you're much more afraid of congenital, i.e. people who are born like it, cinema has a terrible tendency to love to have uh, flashbacks to compare a, a good normality and a bad abnormality. And so that makes it very difficult to have a disabled actor playing a disabled person if you're going to have flashbacks to them uh, winning a marathon uh, the year before, <laughs> uh, running on their normal legs before you digitally give them uh, metal ones. So I, it's a difficult one because I, 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 what I would say is, is actually you need more disabled people involved in the creation, not necessarily on screen, because then that would make the narratives better and the interpretations better and more have more depth. And that's what often that kind of cinema lacks. Plus, you know, I'm all for more disabled people getting more roles. Absolutely. And I think they, they're all going for this diversity clause at the moment. A lot of actors saying that society films should represent so a lot of extras or other cast members are disabled where they're not going to be reliant on so for example if you go and see a lawyer and he's a wheelchair you know you're not going to have a random flashback to him being somewhere so have a disabled actor for that Mm. and i think once you start to get that more and more you will get films about disabled people where you can have them as leads because you're building up their names and and moving on from that but 
so I understand the practicalities of the business, but equally, one of the key problems is the construction of narratives that mean that often you can't, even if you wanted to, because of that notion of flashback, which is a core component of the negation of disabled people, because you are often creating a, a good past normality and a bad negative impairment. So it makes it very difficult to to get more disabled people in those kind of roles. Let's have a look now at your thesis, Dr. Dark. You discuss the medical and the social model of disability. For our audience and also for me, of course, uh, what are these two models and how have they influenced cinema, popular culture and our understanding of disability? Well, I suppose the best way I always uh, can explain it, there's no such thing as people with disabilities. Because disability is something that's external to our bodies. It's out there that constructs and defines how we live our lives as people with impairments. So the the medical model focuses on impairments and says everything about the way I live and I am is to do with my abnormality. Uh, the social model says, you know, all of our bodies are different, but how do we construct things in society that that marginalise particular groups. And the simplest way, obviously, is you put massive steps into every building instead of ramps, and therefore you exclude people with uh, in wheelchairs who, or who can't walk. And that, that's an external thing that can be changed and has been constructed, often intentionally, often not intentionally, to marginalise particular groups about reinforcing power. So, for example, churches are a wonderful example. Almost always they have, are completely inaccessible with massive staircases because they're about constructing a notion of power. And that power is about creating hierarchies. And so that's what society does. And so that's the social model. Things that are socially constructed to impair and marginalise individuals as opposed to the medical model, which says, you know, I can't get in a building because I can't walk, not because of the stairs. And in cinema... The, what cinema is almost always focused on is that medical model of things. So isn't this person who can't walk, isn't their life tragic because they now can't do this, this and this? It never says, isn't their life tragic because society is doing this to them? So it's, it's blaming the individual, putting the cause of the issue on the individual. That's the medical model and that's what cinema does, rather than exploring the social elements of that marginalisation. So a lot of popular films at the moment about euthanasia are absolutely rooted in the medical model. Your life is terrible and tragic. There's all these things you can't do. You should die or you should want to die. They never construct a thing of looking outward saying, my God, this person feels like they do because of all these things us, we as society have constructed to exclude them and make them feel bad about themselves. But why not? There have been films made that look at the black experience from the black point of view, which discusses institutional racism. Why shouldn't there be the same understanding when it comes to issues of disability? Well, there should be. You mean, why, why does it exist? Why well, aren't, why aren't they your, your, your argument is that cinema is... is, is um, is invested in some way in this medical model yep. and and it, it has less interest and I think if I understand correctly for for social for commercial reasons in pursuing the the, the social context the, the the social model of disability so yep. I put it to you why not given that cinema has shown itself willing to look at the black experience through this social lens why can't cinema do the same thing or why doesn't it do so more often when it comes to disability rights issues well, I think it can, but the reason it chooses not to, because its its primary audience is an audience who is under the delusion of or under the influence of the medical model. And so what the audience, which is almost entirely cons considers itself to be normal, what they want to see is things that reinforce their own viewpoint. And that's why it's very difficult. So, for example, I think the race thing is, is an interesting parallel, because I think what what there is, is is race has a notion of normality with it but equally most uh, this sounds awful but most racists don't think they're racists so they want to see things that make them think that they're not racists and, and so that's how cinema can be progressive and pushing the boundaries of kind of ju justice and human
Because actually, most people who have a serious problem with the, with the disability, the kind of normal person, really doesn't have the consciousness of the, I hate saying these kind of things, but the kind of damaging notions they have about others. And I think a good example of that is the amount of people who, for example, many pregnant people often will come up to me and say, I've had the test and my baby is normal. And it's kind of like, which I would say is the equivalent of lots of white people coming up to black people and going, I've had the test and my baby's white. Uh, and it's kind of like, well, so what? You know, that that is so awful. Such an awful thing to say. But it's routine if you're disabled people, you know. It's kind of like, thank God my child isn't going to be like you. And and that's a kind of mainstream accepted idea, which is why a lot of euthanasia films. And you know, I keep throwing in euthanasia films as if, you know, they're, they're kind of quite rare. They are incredibly common. Uh, some of the big blockbusters, uh, Me Before You, is an absolutely pro-euthanasia film, which tells disabled people, you know, you should fundamentally want to die. Uh, if you had that about any other group, uh, people would be rioting in the streets. But it's perfectly OK to do that about us as disabled people. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but... Yeah, you did, brilliant. that. You did brilliantly. In your, in your PhD thesis, Dr. Dark, you aim to, quote reveal the social constructions through cinematic processes of images of physical impairment as disability. So, describe these processes, please, Dr. Dow. Describe the processes. Well, I, well I've mentioned a couple of them. Is, is, is the kind of the nature of the narrative, the storyline, the plot. It, 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 by and large, revolves around a, a notion that to be disabled is to be, is to be a problem in society, or at least a problem to yourself that you you are the problem not society society isn't the problem you are the problem and so so that kind of narrative thing but then it also does it in the nature of the way it constructs images for example if you take a film like i can't remember this in the phd whose life is it anyway it is. Uh, which is about a, a guy who becomes disabled and then fights for the right to die uh, so you can so say you've got the narrative uh, trajectory in itself doing that but equally it's the way you then construct images of what it is to be normal and what it is to be abnormal so for example and i could send you this and you could put it up on with the website and you want if you want there's there's a great image of it in the film it's richard dreyfus and when he's normal he's a sculptor he's very physical so all the all the shots of amir from him are low angle so he's the one with the power you know, he's, he's upright, he's standing, beard, muscular. He doesn't make, you know, m mini little sculptures. He builds 50-foot steel sculptures. He's welding. He's, he's kind of in control of cranes and lifting, and it's all very masculine and very bold and bright and upright, and he's very sexually active. So obviously, so you've got all of those kind of visual images, you know, the, the upright chin, simple things like he's like that all the time, neck up, looking up. So obviously when he becomes disabled, it's always like that, literally looking down. The camera's high, so he's beneath it. So that, that little juxtaposition of moving from uh, kind of like high individual, high actor to low camera with the power, as they become disabled, that, that goes like that. So you start to demean them in the position of the camera, the lighting, you create shadows on their face to imply uh, despair, their kind of very attitude of their body, slouching, you know. He, when he's an artist, he wears great big coats and, you know, bold shirts, open top. Obviously, once he becomes disabled, he never gets out of his pyjamas. Uh, he starts wearing tartan blankets on across his legs. Tartan blankets across your leg is a big, big thing in the disability world if you're of a certain age. Uh, every kind of, those kind of minor little constructions, even within the actual images, the placement of the actors, the lighting, they all do that. And then you also throw in other stereotypes. In, in for example, whose life is it anyway? They're, 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 
a lot of stereotypes and archetypes are, that are equally Jewish all play off one another. So, for example, there's a black male carer who is an absolute character of kind of upbeat, optimistic, fun-loving, uh, hip-hop, soul-loving black guy that's just equally as bad. But actually, it's a further demeaning of him because... He, 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 he's constantly moving, he's j- jiving and dancing, moving to try and cheer up the now quadriplegic guy. And that's not, that's not random, that's about movement. So, and again, you get this in real life, the number of times you would, you would not believe it. If I ever have a meeting with me and a person in front of me, people in front of me are incapable of not crossing their legs every five seconds to show that they can move their legs. And that's just in one-to-one means. And that's not against me. It's their own psychology reassuring them, I can do this, I can do this. And, and then you get the earth mother, the mother in it, and, and, and these kind of stereotypes of femininity, of masculinity, of race, of gender, of sexuality, because obviously once he's quadriplegic, he can't have sex anymore within the narrative. And it's just... If you're in the know, these are almost comedy films. <laughs> they are that bad. But it works in that whole notion of what it's doing to the individual character. And so to get that notion of movement, he's, and he is, he's talking, he's got, he's got, I think he may have headphones on at one point, and he's sitting there constantly going like this, because the guy who's now quadriplegic cannot do that. And it's constantly creating these parallel parallels uh, within character, within scenes, within the past, the present and the future to build this construction of, yeah, he should probably want to die. In your thesis, you outlined the cinematic techniques that construct impairment as disability. For example, how impairment is pathologized as otherness. Now, just so we're clear then, what do you mean by this? And, and how does cinema present disability as otherness exactly? What, what are the techniques that it's using to, to, to do that? Mm. Well, I, I think a lot of what I've just said about whose life is it anyway is part of that process. But I think it, it, it's more about thinking of, say, us and them, you know, and, and I think the mainstream audience, which is under the impression that it thinks of itself as normal, the very things it's seeing is reinforcing to themselves that they're normal. And again, I think this is an interesting point to work. If you ask people uh, what is normal, people don't know what normal is because normal is, is such a vague thing and it doesn't exist because we're all totally different, that normal doesn't exist. So what culture does through the things it does, television, cinema, is is show people how they're normal, not by defining what is normal, but by defining what isn't normal. And so in the past, that was through race or gender, sexuality, and it's always been through disability. And that's why disability, that's why representations of disability like to show broad brush strokes of otherness, not subtle ones. So, for example, uh, invisible impairments are quite uncommon in cinema. What they want is, is something that you can instantly recognise. So often the wheelchair is the key. Uh, so there's lots and lots of wheelchairs that far exceeds our kind of percentage representation of what disabled people are. I think 15% of disabled people are wheelchair users. It's probably something like 90% of the representations of disability <laughs> cinema. Because cinema paints kind of broad brushstrokes of what otherness is, and, and we fulfil that quite easily. And so it does that through, well, simple things. For example, like putting them in a wheelchair. It, that, that's one of the kind of the visual techniques, one of the processes. It, it makes them so that they can't physically do a whole load of things. So there's nothing more embarrassing in cinema than a disability sex scene where two wheelchairs take their side plates off and try and lean across to one another. There's a film called The Raging Moon, which is in the PhD, which I would recommend. Two disabled people have sex, so obviously one of them has to die within a couple of days. Uh, so it, 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 it's that otherness, it's kind of like, it's how we know we're not them, we know that we're us. Uh, and, and that works both ways, actually, because you know as a disabled person you're one of them because of how you're being shown, and you know you're not one of us, i.e. the mainstream audience. Uh, and so it, it, it's that constant building up of these little brushstrokes and layers of what it is to not be normal, really. Uh, and sometimes, 
I, I'm very lucky and very privileged that my lifetime has probably been the most progressive period of of kind of human existence for disabled people, although we are going making massive steps backwards, and you must remember to ask me about that. Uh, so I've lived through that period where actually what is deemed to be otherness has become a very narrowing band. So, for example, in it's tried to be more inclusive and see as acceptable a greater range of people. So in my life, that's included, say, issues of race, issues of gender, issues of sexuality and, and a certain number of impaired, disabled, disabled people particularly those who strive to and reinforce various notions of normality. So, for example, the Boston one is a good example. He's an heroic figure because what his main goal in is to reassert that he is a normal person by walking again after he's lost his legs. So that, that what is being excluded has become narrower, narrower, narrower. And that's a good thing because that means you're including more people as valued in that outer circle. And through my lifetime, since the 70s, kind of post 60s, kind of part because of the uh, kind of like the demands of a racial equality, gender equality, sexual equality, that has that has narrowed what it is to be awful in society is narrowed. And and that's how it does it. It's about what what what's inside that band and how through different periods that band of what otherness is how many he includes and excludes it's a question i was going to say for the end of our conversation but i think it's it's important to raise it now uh, do you believe that the arc of history bends towards progress and if it uh, does if it uh, does then can we can we hope then that the representation of of disability that you've spoken of so far in this conversation can change more dramatically than we've seen it in your lifetime no because i think I think it's going to get much worse. And I think, as I said, I've been very lucky that that narrowing, but now it's getting wider. But equally, what is within that band is now becoming so abject and so negated that for those in it, their life is going to become extinct. By which I mean, for example, pre Take my impairment, for example. I had spine bifida and hydrocephalus. Pre-1960, if you were born with it, you died of it because they didn't know how to treat it. They didn't know how to deal with a lot of the condition. And so you would die, probably by the age of 10, 15, 5, depending on the severity of your impairment. 1960, 59, 60, they, they developed medical technologies that have progressed enough to keep you alive. So you get that point. So most people with spine bifida and hydrocephalus, the largest number of people who were who were supported, were born between 1960 and 1971. And this is related to cinema. So loads of us were conceived, born and survived within that period. But then medical technology has progressed that much further that by 1971, you start the development and the identification of tests to eradicate you, to screen you out, to terminate you and to abort you. Coinciding with society's decision that actually that's what society wants. It wants to erase that group of people collectively. So after that period, less and less of us were born. The same number were conceived as ever. But less and less of us are born. And it's not about whether you're for or against abortion. That, that's a completely different issue. What we're talking about is you've got now particular groups you are identifying with a desire to wipe out. And now you have European states have stated publicly that they want to have 100% eradication of certain types of people. Denmark has identified that it wants to be 100% down syndrome free within 10 years so you're making cultural decisions to erase a particular group of people and as medical technology is progressing you will be be able to identify in the early stages of development more and more groups to erase spina bifida 
my one, Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis. And you're not talking about treatment or cure. You're talking about the eradication through the prevention of living. That's to do with medical technology. That, if you said that about another group, we've identified now whether you're going to have a black baby or a gay baby, and we're going to make a decision to wipe them out. How would that go down? If you say Down syndrome, most of society will go, great. So progress is relative to who you are. If we just come back now to this issue of uh, cinema and popular culture, you've already touched on it, but I think it's important for the audience who will watch this this uh, conversation to just identify a few more of the cliches and cinematic tropes that are used around disabled people. So, for example, I've managed to... I've, I've, I think I've identified a few. Of course, disabled people as objects of pity in comedy. The presence of a disabled actor but little reference made to the condition. What others would you cite as, as classic cinematic tropes? Well, I think there's the disabled person is sexually abnormal. I think often a lot of horror films use kind of either mental illness or physical abnormality as the key to the, the kind of the justification for them being, say, serial killers. They're sexually abnormal. As, as as evil, well, I think that's that's often. For example, I think the the best ones there are, say, James Bond. Almost all James Bond baddies have some kind of physical deformity because that's a broad brushstroke. You don't have to develop a character, explain it. Always oh, disabled. That's why. Uh, and so, and and that's the key thing. It's pitiable, as pathetic as atmosphere. There's nothing like having a few disabled people in in a, in a movie to give it a little bit of you know, atmosphere on where's this going to go. As pathetic, I, I think that that's a key one. As having lives not worthy of living, I think you've got a whole, and you're, you're starting to get more and more of those in relation to older people. Because again, the largest group of disabled people are, are, are older people, you know, uh, elderly people. And then you bring in issues of, say, dementia, uh, kind of blindness, physical infirmity you're starting to get a whole raft of kind of cinema about there's been a couple of israeli films there's uh you know um, you know following on from whose life it is anyway duet for one all of those kind of things and often i refer to these old films uh, quite interestingly and people think oh well that's the past but take something like say a death in the joe day in the death of joe egg or whose life it is anyway whose life is it anyway is on a main theatre street somewhere in the world and all the time. Eddie Izzard uh, made his name as an actor by doing uh, A Day in the Death of Joe Egg on Broadway uh, not that long ago. The same with uh, the guy, the next Bond is going to be, I forgot his name, Clive Owen. Uh, and they, they made their name by doing um, theatre. Theatre is as important as cinema. Because often a lot of what comes to the cinema has come out of theatre, particularly if it's intelligent and articulate, or thinks it's intelligent and articulate. And that's where you get a lot of the most awful disability stuff that uh, will be where actors can experience and learn and train, and then it comes to the screen and they showcase their skills. And and so, I completely forgot what I was saying, but I think... You've got all of those kind of stereotypes. And Colin Barnes did a list. And I, what I will do is, is I'll send you a PDF that I've done that you could actually put up with this for people to download that gives some images of, of what we've been talking about, the parallels of the kind of the good, normal, the abject abnormal. And then it lists the stereotypes and all of those things. And you can put that with it for people to download if you want. Yeah, I think that would be quite useful. Black activists have long accepted that it is films like driving miss daisy guess who's coming to dinner this 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 type of film that generates what they call white liberal guilt and white liberal guilt can be used can be mobilized to do some fantastic things in society so you can create an atmosphere which leads to eventually the election of a mixed race president so Given that the medical model of disability so dominates cinema, it does, and you've, if you've listed some of the films previously, it does generate, let's say, liberal pity. 
Can mm-hmm. liberal pity be mobilised for the kinds of social changes that you and other activists feel are necessary, and that by extension, this will then permeate into cinematic culture? It could, but it won't. And I think partly the reason for that is access to alternatives that often disabled creatives don't have. And so, for example, I think, for example, the advantage, say, uh, issues of race or gender or sexuality, often they have access to, this sounds terribly old-fashioned Marxist, but they often have access to the means of production that disabled people don't. And, and you have a call to resources uh, that, that, that disabled people don't. And so we need that extra bit. We need actually the state with its resources to buy into what we 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 need and deserve and should have as equal citizens uh, with human rights and and so i think that that means it could happen but it also means that it won't because the state has other agendas that it seeks to fulfill often based on economics so for example euthanasia screening all of those kind of things plus we with disability you have a massive contradiction within society and that's what why cinema is so important because often culture and cinema is where those contradictions uh, rub up against one another and explored by which i mean for example disabled people in particularly european societies have more equality and equal rights and human rights than they have ever had anywhere so that's here. That's a thumbs up. On the other side, we are, as societies, are seeking to wipe out certain groups. The complete opposite of this is this. And, and cinema is where those things rub up. And it's kind of like it doesn't really know what it wants. And it gets terribly confused. So it's kind of like, aren't disabled great? They should have this. Oh. But, but we want to wipe out this lot over here, Down syndrome, spina bifida, cystic fibrosis. You know, we don't want to cure them. We don't want them to be born and help. We want to wipe them out. And you've got those massive contradictions. So more disabled people have uh, equality of, of work, for example, yet the vast majority live in inaccessible housing and poverty. Absolute contradictions. And, and society is dealing with those things in equally contradictory ways. Let's wipe out this group so that we can shut all the day centers, shut all of these services because we don't want to pay for them. But then we'll fund a film that will show someone who's lost their legs as a fantastic, normalized, kind of wonderful human being. And so I think fundamentally one of those is going to win. And I think it's not going to be the pro disability one. It's going to be the the kind of normal, the notion of normality will fundamentally win. And that's why I think we're, we're stepping into a long, dark tunnel culturally and politically for disabled people, which I don't really see us coming out of it. Because if, if we're not here to sort of condemn it, question it, or I don't think we'll ever come out of that. Sorry, that sounds awfully pessimistic and terrible. But and, and, and often what cinema does as well is create, uh, I think in my early days, I identified that there's the good cripple and the bad cripple. So there's the deserving of assistance, of help and of life and of equality. And then the undeserving that doesn't really deserve anything, the, the kind of useless eater. And, and I think what, one of the things to say here, and, and, and it's a terrible thing when you result, resort to the Nazis, but actually, if you've got two films, there's a German Nazi film called Ich am Klasse, which is, which is one of their pro-euthanasia films made in the 30s. It's about someone with MS who is convinced by their doctor that they should die at, for the interest of the state. And if you get contemporary films like uh, Me Before You, Whose Life Is Anyway, Do It For One, and you put them together, they're not that different. And often the state has put money into these ones now. And you think to yourself, this, this is incredible. Doesn't anybody know or realise this? A, they don't. 
because often disabled's role in the past has been eradicated. Very few people know about disabled people's uh, part within within the Holocaust and all that kind of thing. And and equally, you have this obsession with kind of normality now that that's becoming so overwhelming. Youth normality that actually the bad cripple is is literally not worthy of anything. And so I, I'm 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 not an optimist in this sense, really. I think society will get better by and large for most people, but I think it probably won't particularly include particularly the congenitally impaired, people who are born with impairments. We just won't exist in the future. It's not about it's not about individual key things. So for example, uh, I, I'm quite negative about the Paralympics, but not about individuals who do it or it itself, but because of how it's going to be used culturally. Culturally, is like, aren't these people wonderful? And I think to myself, well, A, any individual who, who achieves the best they can, absolutely, it's fantastic for them. Absolutely. But actually, there's people starving over there and there's people trapped in their own homes and there's people you know with no jobs no employment no hope over there and there's millions of them and there's 20 of these paralympians it's great for them but actually we as society should be focusing on these people and and we're not and and i can't particularly see us progressing towards that and although i am of the left it's very interesting to me that the left have always had a much bigger problem with disability than the right, because often the right have been rooted in. So, for example, I, I've been involved in some of the uh, anti-assisted suicide campaigns and you end up associating with people that politically you think, oh, my God, you are the most awful people. You know, I'm an atheist. I'm of the left. But you end up associating with right wing religious people who you, you have nothing in common with, but actually they have a greater value of disabled people than the left. And the left have often been very utilitarian, actually, the, the way to relieve the burden of the working classes is to lift as many burdens as you can off of them, i.e. disabled people, and get rid of them. And so uh, it's, it's, and society, and that's what's great about cinema, it's what's great about culture. You have all of these contradictions in society about disability, about race, about gender, and culture is where they all come and they rub up against one another that makes it just fantastic and beautiful and wonderful to watch. Before we dive into some of the films that have been huge successes with disability rights themes, I just want you to just set out three films for people watching this video to 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 look for to try and rent or maybe buy that you think do a good job when it comes to the portrayal of disability rights themes or disabled actors i i think it, it's I'll, I'll give i'll try and give you three but the first one i would say is young frankenstein by mel brooks it's no coincidence he's jewish he knows about the holocaust he knows about the politics of being marginalized and excluded and, and he brings that to bear on, on, on impairment and disability in Young Frankenstein in a way that is just beautiful. Um, what, and how he does that is because he plays with it. He makes what it is to be human ridiculous because it is ridiculous to be a human being. We concern ourselves with trivia and we ignore the massive and the significant, be that death destruction or whatever and we focus on trivialities that we worry ourselves to death with and and issues of what the body is and again as a jewish person he's aware of how bodies were constructed as being other and he plays with all of those things so young frankenstein is is full of disability full of impairment and it plays with the cinema of it as well so for example in the original frankenstein there's a bit where the monster goes to see a blind hermit and the blind hermit treats him as a a normal human being because he can't see his difference and and then the monster the creature responds to him in a kind of positive humanly way and he plays with that kind of representation as well as it's just being really really funny and it's throughout the film it's just absolutely brilliant so it plays with it, it explores it it understands it it challenges it and it and it and it, it uses it as well for the narrative and it's just really really good i think one of the things I see as positive is negative because I think and I think James Baldwin said this about a lot of images of, of representations of black people that were awful because you can actually say 
Yes, that's how I'm seen. These these way these people are showing me, you know, which I think are terrible and wrong. But actually, I think, yeah, that's how these normal people view me. And there's a film called The Raging New, which is out on DVD and Blu-ray. In America, it was called Far Away Tomorrow. Uh, don't ask me why, I have no idea. And that's about two disabled people who are uh, what, who, who become acquired and they end up being put in a home, a residential home, and they get one gets a job as a telephonist. They have an affair, one dies because they have an affair, which is quite random, as if any kind of bacteria is going to kill a disabled person. And, and it is awful, but it's so awful, you think, that explains so much about my life. So, for example, they're put in a home. You know, he, he can't walk. That's it. He's just put in a home. It's like random. What? What? This is insane. And my mother loved it. My mother loved that film because it legitimated to her putting me into a segregated special school. And you, you can get so much out of it. It's so bad. It's so awful that you think, yeah. And it explains so much to me. And, and anyone who would see it would think, this is ridiculous, and yet you can see it continuing and continuing and continuing. You know, special schools are still not an issue. Institutions are still not an issue. Putting people in homes, which is still very common in particularly mainland Europe, less so here, but we still do it as well. So so uh, The Raging Moon, absolutely incredible. It's, it's a 1971 film, just come out on Blu-ray DVD. It's insane. But, but it actually, you end up feeling liberated by thinking, Yes, that's my life. This this is why people see like me are. A, because you're you're seeing it enacted, but equally you're you're seeing it culturally reinforced. That's just fantastic. Another film, I suppose, more more recently, I I, I like anything with a wheelchair. I'm a wheelchair user, so I I love wheelchair movies. So there's 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 a couple of films sort of like from the 80s and 90s uh, oh, I forgot what it's called the, the water the waterfall it's it's kind of an Eric Stoltz film with Helen Hunt uh, and that's about a wheelchair user who's who's acquired again but is engaged in society but the one I would recommend and it is literally for one scene is Terry Gilliam's The Fisher King which is Robin Williams as a kind of mentally ill vagrant. But there's one whole scene where Robin Williams introduces his kind of mentor, kind of Jeff Bridges, to a disabled guy in uh, a big station in New York City. And this 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 guy in a wheelchair is played by Tom Waits. So he's got a really gravelly voice and whatever. And it's literally one scene. And it explains... I, I remember thinking, I wanted to go, yes, it, it explains disability in society in one scene. Because he basically says in his gravelly voice, you know, and he's a working class kind of wheelchair beggar. And he, he says to Jeff Bridges, he says something like, uh, uh, you know, to paraphrase, he says, you know, every morning when you go to work and you hate your boss, you got a pair of scissors on your table and you think... I want this pair of scissors. I want to stab the fucking shit out of my boss because I'm just nothing to him. I'm nothing to say. I'm a worker and I'm exploited and I'm used it. And he said, and then you go to work and you see me in the station, poor, in a wheelchair, dirty. And every time you want to pick up those scissors, you think, no, because at least I'm not like him. So you put the scissors back down, you put your head down and you keep working and you do as you're told. And that's what normal people are trapped in. And that one scene in The Fisher King, I always play it over and over again to any discussion, any group. Plus, it's fantastic. It's well acted, well made and absolutely true. Just get that scene. You can probably even download it and put it with a DVD. It's just fantastic. Because... The core thing for disabled people, we will never we will never be free till we free normal people 
from the delusion that they're normal. Okay, so those those are your your top picks: um, Young Frankenstein, uh, Raging Moon, and one scene from The Fisher King. What about three films which will live forever as being the most abominable, uh, the most <laughs> terrible films that uh, feature disabled uh, disability themes? Can you give us who who's in your rogues gallery, Doctor? <laughs> Well, that would be so many, many, many films. Well, I hope they're not on the list that I've got here. So, just, just if, if you could, if if three could jump out at you, that would be great. Well, I think duet for one, and and because it's so icon iconographic, uh, as as a play, as a film, uh, it, it's on Broadway all the time. It, they they've done various cinema versions of it. They've done various television versions of it. Uh, and what it says and how it constructs disabled people is just utterly an abomination. So, 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 uh, whose life is it anyway? I'd follow another film that has a similar kind of theme, and it's called Duet for One. Uh, and again, it's a, it comes from a massive hit play that's on all the time, very well acted. But the film is incredible because it. It has narrative elements that are just so comical they're they're embarrassing. Do you, do you, you know Steptoe and Son that was on in British television? Indeed. Yeah. Well, in, in this, uh, Julie Andrews, the Julie Andrews, plays a, a violinist who gets MS. And she ends up hating herself, herself so much. And she's a, a, an upper class, educated... She starts having an affair with the equivalent of Steptoe and Son. And it is just so stupid, so ignorant and so ridiculous that it that it that it's gotta go in that, that kind of list of abominations of cinema. Just the cinema on its own, let alone adding in the disability, because it is just utterly stupid. But because it's disability, they think they can just throw in these things that you just you wouldn't put anywhere else. And again, that, that's another kind of cliche of disability. You throw in things that you just think you, you wouldn't be able you wouldn't even think about doing this anywhere else, let alone getting away with it. And I suppose then the other the other kind of is comedy. I think for example the Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor thing, see no evil, hear no evil, which is just cliche upon stereotype upon archetype upon stereotype upon cliche and it's laughing at the the visually impaired and the hearing impaired there's nothing with there's nothing kind of empathetic it is just laughing at blind and deaf people in a way that you just think again if you did it about any other group you would be hung drawn and quartered and, and I, I like Gene Wilder and, I like, and I'm a great Richard Pryor fan and you think why on earth but again Often, people who understand oppression, Richard Pryor did, absolutely couldn't apply it to another group, and, and and that has always been a massive disappointment to me. For so many people, you know, women, you know, great feminists do this, and then they'll do something about disability, and you think, oh God, why, why, why? So that so they're the, they're the three worst, okay. I think often, particularly in, in race and sexuality and gender, you know, you've got your equality group, but you, you still know that you are a marginalised group, you are an oppressed group, there is a lot of negativity, so you buy into a lot of the other norms that actually participate in the oppression of others. What do you make, Dr. Dark, of the film Rain Man? Huge success, made huge uh, money at the box office, critically acclaimed, what do you make of it? it's a very difficult one really because I think often individual films are quite good and quite enjoyable I quite enjoy Rain Man uh, but their kind of significance culturally and, and on the on the individual lives of others can be quite devastating so for example uh, another good example if you've got Rain Man with autism you've got something like uh, the Douglas Bader story which the name escapes me, was about a, a fighter pilot who lost both of his legs, probably the same with the Boston, the new one. 
They become the tools to beat other disabled people with. Why can't you be like them? So I, I've, I've heard people with, uh, you know, say about people with autism, well, you know, they could always go and teach maths because they'll be able to add up and figure out shit like that really easily. So they become tools to beat other people, and that's their problem. So often it's not about individual films or individual characters. It's about how they build up on all these other things. So, for example, you then what, what Rain Man led to were 10 other films over the last 20 years about people with autism who were all savants, who were geniuses at figuring out stuff. And, and often most people with autism are not like that, you know, and they become they become the scenario of what it is to be like that, when in fact they are unique within that uniqueness, that have no relation to reality on a kind of everyday scale, and they become tool, further tools of oppression. And so that's, that's why I have a problem with it. I thought, you know, Dustin Hoffman did quite a good role, and there are, there are people like that, uh, and uh, I quite like Tom Cruise. But it, it's more about what they inspire and how... This sounds awful, but the weak willed audience become to see them as real. So, for example, a good example of that is the Elephant Man. You can probably I'll come to that, that one, yeah. Is the Elephant Man is most people presume that to be the true story of the Elephant Man, but actually he he had a lot more control and autonomy and agency over his own life than the film gives him. It takes away almost everything about him that he had. He was very rich. He made his own decision to retwi- retire into a hospital. He, he, he was very successful. He, he earned 50 times the national average touring. He did it as a freak, I accept that. But actually in that era to make a living, to become very successful, he had a great life compared to a lot of ordinary working class people. And, and, and equally often that something like The Elephant Man, which I, I'm a big fan of The Elephant Man in, in good and bad ways, because of the way it demeans the working class. The working class are all horrible, despicable people in The Elephant Man, and the middle classes are all wonderful, heroic individuals. And and actually, that wasn't true either. You know, a lot of working class people were absolutely fantastic to The Elephant Man, and a lot of middle class people were awful. And so it's the way it distorts those realities uh, to to favour a particular ideology that takes away from even real disabled people that I have a big problem with. What about a film such as the 1990s success, Breaking the Waves, Dr. Dark? What do you make of that? Breaking the Waves. Well, I've been very, you know, very interested in, in the kind of assisted suicide debate over the last 10, 15 years. And sadly, Breaking the Waves, I... Well, the first thing is Emily. What Emily Watson is her name? Uh, is is fantastic. I, I think a. I think she's incredibly attractive. Uh, I think she's a great actress and fantastic. But as a narrative, it's kind of like someone becomes disabled. They tell their wife to go out and have sex with lots of people and kill me. That that's that narrative in in an essence, and it's kind of like if you did that in any other story, you would be laughed out. But in cinema about disability, it becomes a masterpiece, and it isn't. Don't get me wrong, uh, it, that's a Lars von Trier movie. And if you take his later film, The Idiots, and The Idiots is a masterpiece of disability. It's a Danish film called The Idiots. And that's where he, it's about a group of non-disabled people go around pretending to be disabled with learning difficulties and various impairments to hoodwink the normal community. And, and manipulate them and play them. And that is a masterpiece because it's playing with it. So it's exactly the same director, Lars von Trier's. Breaking the Waves is awful. The Idiots is a masterpiece. And I think I'll let him off because uh, Breaking the Waves was one of his first films and The Idiots was a lighter one. He's been he'd more developed to ideas of narrative and understanding. But Breaking the Waves is is just dreadful. And it, which is a shame because Stellan Skarsgård is brilliant. Emily Watson is brilliant. And I love Lars von Trier, but together it was the most. In a way, it started the trend towards euthanasia and disabled people movies that we're now suffering quite significantly from. That they're they're exploding all over the place. I've got a few more for you. Uh, Taxi Driver and the Madness of King George. The Madness of King George. Uh, 
I, I didn't mind the madness of King George. I think it's a fairly, you know, it, it it's a fairly accurate, as far as one can tell, about an individual's uh, onset of mental illness and disease and how people tried to hide it. I think it's an interesting one about class, the upper class and disability, and how they try and construct it as something other or eradicate it completely. So, so I did quite enjoy that. Uh, what was the other one you said? Uh, taxi driver. Taxi driver. Which bit of taxi... Have you seen taxi drivers about mental illness? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I nabbed that from your from your thesis, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... Because I, I, I never illness... understood taxi driver as being a discussion of that. And that's, that's where disability or that condition is kind of... It's... It, for me, it's not a primary driver of the film, but it's it, but it's interesting how I'm going to come to this a bit later. Mental illness is now something that we seem to be much more aware of, mm. uh, and I don't know what that says about where we are culturally. Uh, why suddenly that's become prominent, but we discuss it more. So it's curious that Taxi Driver. I would never have thought about that being as a, a film about mental illness, but your thesis turned mm. me on to that. So. What do you make of that? I mean, we can just we can either discuss Taxi Driver, or if you prefer, we can discuss Carlito's Way, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, um, well, I, I think mental illness is very interesting because I think it it comes back to that whole thing as as your as your as society has increasing issues of mental illness, uh, culture will start to deal with it, and the kind of like post war mental illness uh, because of the failures of consumerism whatever and the pressures of that have created a massive surge in mental illness so culture starts to deal with that and I think ta what Taxi Driver is trying to rationalise it in that good cripple bad cripple so it doesn't have a problem with being mental ill as long as you're not evil with it and I think Taxi Driver tries to merge the two but this, this isn't really mental illness. It is mental illness, but actually it's just evil. And, and, and that's how we've got to see that. And, you know, we don't have to deal with that. And so it, 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 it's slightly confused. But again, it, what's interesting is it does have some really good stuff because it fails to... It identifies how society fails to deal with issues that are coming out of the nature of society every day. Loneliness, isolation marginalization poverty key drivers in mental illness that are all within taxi driver and yet it, it quickly reverts to him being about him being evil and it's kind of like innate with him him rather than socially constructed or as a result of the environment that he's in so for example and i, and I think it, 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 it's kind of constantly doing those two sides of those two things which is what makes it interesting because I'm not sure, it doesn't really say it's one or the other, but it's about how some are going to say this is just innate evil, but actually I'm exploring that it is about loneliness, isolation, sexual frustration, the fantasies of the glamour woman and your, you know, your working classness, the way you have to work, you're tired, you're poor, all of those things that are contributes to mental illness. And I, I quite enjoyed Taxi Driver and I thought it, it did that very well. But I think it... And that's one of the problems in dealing in any kind of representation. You may have an intent in your exploration of something, but actually the audience may interpret it in a completely different way that you have no control over, even if you have worked very hard to prevent that. So I think the audience can see Taxi Driver as being purely about masculine evil as opposed to a product of contemporary society. And I think that's what Scorsese intends, but I think there's probably one too many things in it that allow the audience to do that. You can't stop the audience doing that, but you can try and inhibit them doing that. Well, let's see if that um, test applies to my next film, the very celebrated My Left Foot. My Left Foot. It's... Uh, I, I have a bit of a soft spot for my left foot because I think often there aren't a lot of representations of disability that are quite working class and, and, and I'm a working class lad and so I, I do quite like a lot of that that kind of 
the most interesting thing about my left foot actually are the other elements of it. So, for example, the notions of masculinity, the notion, the notions of what it is to be a mother, the notions of what it is to be a Catholic, and the notions of what it is to be poor. And I think uh, I did a chapter in a book called The Pathology of the Body, uh, which was mainly about the, the construction of the family within uh, my left foot, which is one of the best things I've ever written, actually. But I, but I think it, in itself, and again, it, it much what it likes, what cinema likes is individual stories that may not have a lot of resonance to kind of collective identities. And I grew up in a, in a very working class environment. My brother tried to stab me when I was about 10 and I had to jump out the front window. And, and so, and that's very my left footish kind of thing, that aggression, the drinking and the violence and the fighting. And, and I grew up with a lot of that. So I quite like it. Uh, I think in, in, in that instance, for example, it's a shame that they couldn't have got a disabled actor because I think it would have given it a lot more power and a lot more bite. Uh, and there, are, there were no flashbacks. He doesn't have a flashback to being normal at any point. So it's quite nice to see a film about uh, a congenital impairment, because there aren't that many. Um, I, I understand why it got the Oscar, and it did sort of set a trend for that. That was the kind of first big one. A lot of people uh, hold against it that it did launch the career of Daniel Day-Lewis and his an eternity of gurning for, uh, <laughs> for actors to copy from then on. Uh, but I, I think it's a fascinating film uh, because of class, uh, you know, because I'm an old leftist and, and I think class is actually much more important often than most other things, even in disability by and large. So, for example, successful disabled people tend to be acquired, educated, middle class white people. So that's about that shows it's often more about class than it is impairment. And so I, I think my left foot is fascinating in a way for all the other things other than the, the impairment in it. But it actually brings it together really nicely. All right, and one last one, Carlito's Way, a film that I would never have thought of as being a film which specifically addresses issues of disability, but what do you make of that? Mm. Uh, I, I, I think I, I saw Carlito's Way, I, I think it's, it's an early 90s film, so it was just after I started my PhD. And, and one of the things when I started my PhD is, is I started to, uh, in the old days of VHS, and, of course, you can now do it on, on, on kind of digital as well. But I started to record films of disability and, uh, and, and buy them on VHS and whatever, which was an utter, complete mistake. Because when you've got about three, three four, five thousand videos on your shelf of all these different films where disability is, is a kind of key role. It may be a minor role, but often it's a, a transitional point or, or a point that transcends it. A bit like The Fisher King. It's one scene, but that scene is what the whole film is about. And it's brilliant. And Carlito's Way, there's a whole there's a whole bit in the middle of it about a guy in a wheelchair. Uh, and, and actually it shows the absolute notion of equality of Carlito, because he has no qualms about killing the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> because he sees him in an absolutely equal way. He's a bad guy, kill him. And so, and it, 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 it's, a, it's of its period, it's of that era, and, but equally, it was one of the first films where you suddenly realised, I suddenly realised, it is everywhere, disability is everywhere, and it only works as a kind of social function of control and and interpretation if it's everywhere but you don't think of it as everywhere and when I started to collect these films and you do it would be every film I'd have to get every film because even like you'd watch some random shit Arnold Schwarzenegger film and there's a film where he, Dennis Hopper is a, is a bomber in it a kind of terrorist and it's all because he didn't get a disability pension when he hurt his hand in 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 a police operation, and you just think this is absolutely everywhere, and and so I've managed to get over that addiction, so I don't collect them anymore. Uh, but they, it is absolutely everywhere. And Carlito's way 
encapsulates and captures that because it, you wouldn't think it would have disability in it. You wouldn't think it would be about disability. It wouldn't have any element of it. But actually, it's there all the time. And again, is it mental illness? This kind of pathological desire for violence. There's little elements all, all throughout it that just make you think, this is fascinating. And, and I, when, when I talk about cinema and disability, I make it sound like it's awful, but actually it's wonderful and it's fascinating. It's engaging, it's creative, and it makes you think. So the disability may be awful, but actually it makes you think, who am I, what am I, what is society? And that's what art should do, and that's why cinema is art. It really is. I mean, I'm thinking. I'm thinking now of a really influential '90s movie, Robo. Oh, late '80s. So late late '80s movie, Robocop. Absolutely. Robocop is uh, the medical model of disability, front and center, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. But throw in the notion of normalisation, and then you throw in what it is to be normal because of the kind of people he seeks to destroy and control. And, and kind of police is kind of like the aberrant nature of society. So all of that's in there. And, and might you say to people, what's Robocop? They wouldn't think the disability one. But the point is he's lost limbs. He's, he's been seriously injured. He's, he's got head injuries. It's, it's all there. Let me just go back to the, the root of our conversation. We focused a lot on cinema, Dr. Dark. But there is an argument that to be made that television is now the focus of our popular attention in terms of popular culture. So, mm -hmm. so are you now directing your powers towards a critical review of television? Because there's, there's some case studies I'm going to mention in a moment, but television really is a really important vector for our culture. So are you now more and more interested in what's happening on television? Not particularly, but also yes, in the sense that, uh, Film is primarily watched on television. Uh, television shows films all the time, and that's what most people watch. A lot of what other... I think what I mean by these series, Breaking Bad, on Game of Thrones... Yeah, and, and, and it's not going to last. Uh, but even those, those kind of series are, are, are almost cinematic. They're like uh, they're like a franchise movie, you know. They are they are getting longer and longer, you know. Uh, even like Twin Peaks, some Twin Peaks episodes are an hour and a half. It's full of disability, by the way. David Lynch is obsessed with disability. Uh, every David Lynch film you'll ever see has got disability. In it. So I, I suppose I, I'm I'm veering towards not making the distinction because I think they're all just culture, and culture is the place where idealism and reality clash. So the ideal of society, the kind of we all love one another, we're all fair, we're all just, uh, and the reality is, is actually we want to get rid of certain groups. You know, we're going to ignore poverty. You know, it's everywhere. All those kind of and culture is where those things rub up against one another. Uh, sometimes very crassly, sometimes without thinking, and sometimes really creatively. I think a lot of the big dramas are fascinating. I think a lot of the political dramas. In France, Baron Noir, or say Marseille, or, or the, the big German one recently, the big Amazon drama. Uh, again, notions of what it is to be normal within that. I, I think what I would say is this society and culture is moving towards, because it's becoming a, a rooted a lot more in fear, fear of the other. Uh, and, and what the other is, is becoming vaguer. Uh, terrorism. Islam, a kind of real crass ideas of otherness, and actually culture is where that battle is most visible. Uh, and, and so, as disability decreases as a reality in society, as it will over the next 10, 20, 30 years, I, I can see those kind of dramas as where defining both personal, regional, national and international identities of what it is to be human are where that's played out. And I think the battle, the fight against terrorism, for example, which is often merged with disability, for example, uh, a lot of things that are being defined as terrorism attacks, for example, in Britain, are actually cases of mental illness. They're not terrorism in the slightest. And, and so they're that's going to be a kind of a forum 
from that kind of debate and engagement and those merging of, of the kind of the real and the ideal clashing against one another. Uh, television is very important, but e- and that particularly the way television is watched. So, for example, I, I understand that, say, Game of Thrones isn't a film, it's television, but people will watch it as if it's a 12-hour film in one city, that kind of box set. I do. Binging mentality. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do. I watch Baron Noir, which is a political French thing uh, about a politician in Dunkirk. I watched eight, eight in a row, you know, and it's just not watching a film. It's just a very long film of depth. And so I, I think they're all, all of those kinds of things are merging in a way that I think cinema should be a little bit afraid of. But then cinema is trying to compete by making longer and longer films as well. But it, it's just... It's great. I think I think all this material is great, and the more people making it, the more of it there is. I feel a bit sad for it as well, really, because when I was a kid, if there was a major thing, literally the whole population would watch it. Now, something, say, like Game of Thrones, which is a major significance, is watched by about a million people. Very few people will have ever watched it, and most of them work for magazines and television. That's why it's such a such a huge success. Yeah. <laughs> you, better, you better get the right audience. However, um, one of the things that's interesting about television is perhaps you well you can confirm this: is television giving us new stereotypes about disabled people and disability themes? So, for example, I've noticed how disabled characters are used to humanise the main character, or disability is used to humanise the the lead, or mm. there is the the disabled character as a sidekick in the way in which the black actor used to be the sidekick or still is the sidekick are you seeing new tropes we, we we've discussed this previously in our conversation but mm. is television because it's much more familiar and located in the in the kind of middle class family environment to a, to a, to a, to, a, to a great extent is television delivering us new and different stereotypes I, w- I wouldn't say they're new, but I think what you're seeing is the explosion of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, disability has always been on television. It's always been those kind of things. I am but I think, being the but I think what you're getting now, because there are so many channels and so much is being made, you're seeing much more of those casual stereotypes that aren't necessarily bad. So, for example, I think, you know, uh, a lot of those uh, black actors, say, in the 60s, who would be the sidekick to the main white guy in I Spy or Mission Impossible, that liberal white guilt thing, and it helped push it push it that step forward. And I, I think it will do that for disabled people who are allowed to live and who can normalise. And I think it will, if it will benefit those few. Uh, and in a way... That's about the best we can hope for. It isn't gonna. It isn't gonna save the rest of us. But actually, for those that are going to exist, it is a good thing because at least it isn't uh, awful and let's kill everybody. There are. They're the good cripple, uh, and it, it it beats the hell out of being the bad cripple that everybody wants to kill. So, including Denmark. <laughs> And all other societies. I'm being unfair on Denmark. They, they're just explicit. We're all doing it. So. But I think they, they are good and they are kind of progressive. But equally, it will be that will be good for individuals. And I think uh, Angela Davis used to say, you don't judge progress on individual advancement, but group achievement. What you judge it on is group advancement. And I think... It's good for the individual, but it won't be good for, for all of us. Because, again, what it often is reinforcing is that notion of normality, which is the very thing that oppresses us and those who believe in normality. And I come back, you know, disabled are only going to be free when normal people are free from their own delusion of what they are. I think your point speaks to my next question, which would be, how would you explain the rise of Peter Dinklage, the Tyrion Lannister character in Game of Thrones? Mm. How do you explain the 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 the, the rise of of uh, of this character of this actor of short stature? Because as I said at the top of our conversation, he's in the best television program at the moment. He's also in last year's 
from my from my point of view, I don't know what you think, but certainly the best the best movie, the uh, three billboards in Ebbing, Missouri. How do you explain his rise, and does it say something about our culture, and does it suggest? Uh, maybe I'm bundling too many questions in one here, but does it not suggest that we are becoming more open as a society? A uh, popular culture is willing to absorb more and a greater variety of influences, and perhaps we can hope that we can move away from this medical model to a social model of disability. Uh, yes and no. I, I, I'm a big fan of Peter Tinklage. I've watched most of his films. I, I followed his early career. Uh, there's a film, actually one of his first films is called something like The Station Master, I think, which is a, which is a cracking little film. Uh, I think Dwarfs have always been popular, eh? Because they're this. This sounds awful, but they're not a lot of bother, in in the sense that you haven't got to do much to include them. You haven't got to build ramps. You haven't got to get special facilities. They can just be there. And but equally, and they're a cheap I'm laugh a, as well, right? They've been uh, used. In my understanding of popular culture, the dwarf has been. Uh, you mentioned before that terrible movie Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor. It's yeah. a it's a cheap laugh, isn't it? Really, you put. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So there's yes. A, there's an instant comedic value of of Absolutely. putting a dwarf on well, screen, but comedic but Peter or, Dinklage... or curi curio or atmosphere. Yeah. But Peter uh, Dinklage has gone beyond that. Yeah, he has gone beyond that, but and that's good because I think it is that the sidekick kind of thing that you were talking about, the kind of inclusiveness. Uh, I, I think his problem is he's going to be he's going to often be. Uh, given a lot of really bad roles, for example, that reinforce the kind of negativity of what it is to be a dwarf. But often society and cinema is no different, likes its icons of difference as normal as they can possibly be. And I think Peter Dinklage is that, not as an individual. And again, it's never about the individual. He is an actor who's getting as much work as he can but equally, he's not that different in, say, I'd say Game of Thrones than the curio, than the atmosphere. It's a bigger role. Uh, I accept that. But equally, is it, is it that different? It's a fantasy film, so it's reducing it to putting him in a fantasy. I, I think he's a great actor and I admire him a lot and I hope he gets a lot more roles. But my concern is, is he's the good cripple. He's the one who can normalise. He... he he, he reinforces the things that normality wants reinforcing and doesn't really bring a lot of that, not his fault, but the roles as kind of challenging what it is to be different. Uh, I think, for example, and again, it's a very dangerous thing because I think in three billboards to in Ebbing, Missouri, a lot of people have disliked his thing because he's a bit of a sad character. Indeed, yeah. But actually, it's that that's the kind of representation I think is actually very worthwhile because what it is saying is, is that society will marginalise people to be like that. But and I think Ebbing, Missouri tries to construct that actually it's such a dysfunctional kind of community they're in that people end up feeling like that. Your Everybody is, is, in that film has something. I think that's yes. Yeah. Yes. Your problem is, is that the audience will say, oh, well, he's like that because he's a dwarf, when in fact he's like that because of the nature of society. And although Ebbing, Missouri film tries to get that across, it doesn't mean the audience won't interpret it as being, oh, well, he's like that because he's a dwarf. You know, of course, his life's shit and miserable and he's a bit of a loser. He's a dwarf. And, and it's that balance that, and I think Ebbing, Missouri does it very well, but it doesn't mean it will achieve anything because people will interpret it in their own way because they're bringing a hundred years or an entire life of other representations of, of people of short stature to seeing him. So you can't erase everything you've ever seen when you see something that's challenging. And actually, you will interpret what's in front of you, even if it's being the opposite of what you've been taught, you will see it in that way. And that, that's, a, I think, a big problem for individual actors and, and individual films, that they may themselves be really quite challenging and fantastic, but actually they probably won't make much significance because they're fighting against uh, a tsunami of the history of representation.
It's, and so, for example, it takes 20, 30, 40 years. I think you're talk, when you talked about Sidney Poitier in, in those films in the 60s, you are now only seeing 40, 50 years later the achievement of that. It's almost from In the Heat of the Night to Panther almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and you need in, in the the night, and you needed you needed that black exploitation cinema in the middle of it as well, and you needed you know the the kind of uh, the Bill Cosby stuff and Mission Impossible. You've had all of that, and I, I I don't see disabled people getting that because we don't tend to main we don't maintain it. That's what I think of because society is so fickle in in its relation to disabled people. You know, it loves us one week and then the next week we're out. Whereas I think with race, gender and sexuality, they have, they've built on their platforms, often because they've had the access to the means of production themselves or the education or the access that have made them have that capacity that I think disabled people have always lacked and will probably continue to lack. There is also a capitalist driver to this, if you allow me to say. There is, There was the, the black pound or the black dollar, so to speak, that could drive some of the black exploitation movies of the 1970s or some of these uh, uh, noble projects that uh, Sidney Poitier was involved in. Um, it, it, it may well be possible that Peter Dinklage, he, mm. he uses his A-list status to to promote a certain type of cinema maybe he's not interested at all in going down that direction or it may well be that Peter Dinklage becomes a kind of disabled Morgan Freeman where he only ever plays these kinds of uh, noble glorious saintly type characters I mean what would you think of that as as a sort of a destination for for an actor of his talent well, I, I think he'll probably end up in the Morgan Freeman uh, type of thing. Because, and again, that's great for him as an individual. And, you know, he he shouldn't have to worry about the nature of society. He's just an actor and he's doing his job. And I, I don't have a problem with that and what he becomes and how he exploits it. I think the difference is, and again, you, you're talking about those films of the 60s and black exploitation is, what you had is you had a whole range of people uh, coming through to impact, whereas in disability, it's one or two. And, and and it's not just in front of screen. So, for example, all of those black directors, Mario Van Peebles, Mario Van Peebles Jr., uh, the Wayne brothers, and all of those right. others. Yeah. And, and so you had a whole kind of culture of people having access learning the craft, learning the art, learning the nature of the business to then do other stuff with a whole range of other actors. That's what disabled people don't have. And that's why it probably won't have any lasting impact when you're fighting against the cultural pressures of, you know, marginalisation, exclusion and eradication, particular groups. And we will often be left to, in our own little corner, exploited to deliver a reinforcement of certain cultural perspectives. So the Paralympics is about reinforcing the good cripple, the bad cripple, so that society can do what it wants over here. And and it's that that power base that we lack and don't have. So what you will always have is isolated individuals. We've got like Adam Hills on the television here, uh, Liz Carr in Silent Witness, and they're all excellent. But they're they're isolated. It's one there, it's one there, it's one there. Whereas with black, with gender, race, even with sexuality, you you've got a superstructure that you've constantly built upon to make significant change. What about the argument that the purple pound could deliver the kind of cultural products that can move move society forward? I think your problem is is you've got a lot of disabled people who hate disabled people in a way that I think is not so true of race, gender or sexuality. You have individual kind of cliques and marginalisations within all cultures, race, gender, sexuality, all those kind of things, like you talked about the transgender community, the LGBT stuff. But I think it's the mainstream view of disabled people is that they often buy into the very things that oppress them, normality, that actually it's only when we can collectively 
think as one that that can make significant change. So, for example, most disabled people I know will never go and watch a disability film. And they'll go and watch the mainstream stuff because they want to go out with their friends, their normal friends, and do normal things. They don't want to be trapped into doing that. And and that's a big problem, again, why I think we won't have that impact. We won't create that change. We're going to move towards the end of this conversation now. My last question to you was, what improvements are you looking for from the film industry in terms of its portrayal of disabled people? That question is totally redundant based on everything that we've discussed over the last hour or so. So I'm trying to think how we could, how we could end this, this conversation, Dr. Dark. Um, I'll, I'll, is, me, I'll, I'll tell you how I would end it. Okay. I, I, went, I went to a, a conference recently uh, about disability in cinema, and, and, uh, and we got some, and they had got a, a whole load of kind of key black art people there to talk about it. Uh, and there was an agent up front, a, a, a kind of cinema agent, and she said that uh, L- uh, uh, Idris Elba has broken through. Uh, and one of the black actresses said, uh, and why is that? And uh, and this agent said, well, because he's not seen as black anymore. And this actress said, but that's the worst possible thing that he's broken through because he's no longer black. And and she was, you know, this was an, an, a, a normal, ordinary woman, quite well-known actress. I think she's in Casualty or Holby. And, and, and she was absolutely incandescent. And and that's what you're fighting against. And, and then the other thing was is a lot of the disabled people were going, oh, well, uh, we've got to make quality. What matters is, is we've got to make our own quality product. And I said, that's not true. I said, we should be given the position to make utter shit that nobody watches. Because white people are doing that all the time. They make utter shit that nobody watches. That's what white, middle-class, normal people do. And I want the right to be pumping out drivel and crap because that's how we'll learn. That's how we'll make better stuff. That's how we'll develop quality. Why are you holding us up to this standard that is just going to knock us further down when they're banging out shit left, right and centre? And a good example of that, the National Lottery in England, in, in the 90s, they funded 100 films. Only about five ever saw the light of day in the cinema. The other 95 were in a vault, all made by educated, affluent, white, middle-class people that nobody had the slightest interest in distributing. That's what I want the right to do. And that's when we'll make a difference. So how do we do that then? Uh, At at no point in our conversation have we really touched on the the, the financing uh, of cinema in any real detail. Is it basically that uh, creative, uh, creative types, disabled non-disabled should have access to public money to be able to green light these projects is that is 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 that the issue then we need we need to to make sure that when governments and national authorities are distributing grants for cultural purposes that there there is a strong uh, disability rights component and that that they have to meet the test in a way in which they have to meet the test increasingly when it comes to issues to do with black and minority ethnic uh, cultural products mm. I think there's two things. A, we need to be honest about what has happened. And that thing about most things that are funded are rubbish and never see the light of day. And we're not honest about that. And then we need to sort of say, well, actually, we now need to flip that. So, for example, if you're funding 90% this and 10% us, let's flip it for five years that we get the 90% and they get the 10%. And we're judged on exactly the same basis that we're allowed to make as much crap as they did without them saying, oh, you know, this isn't very good. You shouldn't be allowed to do this. Well, you didn't say that to them. And some of those people have gone on to be great directors and great artists, but their first film, five films, never saw the light of day, despite the fact they were all state funded, all all this. And we're not given that opportunity. We, we, we're given, and, and I think it's true of black people, uh, often of women as well. It's kind of like, you, you're not meeting the standard. It's kind of like, 
Hold on a minute. You've never met the standard. And that's what we need. Dr. Dart, thank you. Thank you.